So Professor Giuseppe Camara is from the Federal University of Mato Grosso do Sul. He was me my supervisor like more than 10 years ago. Uh, I went to to Mato Grosso do Sul to learn how to work with FTIR in situ. And okay, in the, the last year he started to to study and to write about uh, scientific writing. And I I enjoy a lot every time that Giuseppe gives a lecture about the topic that is very important uh, for all of us. Okay. It is not only useful to, to write scientific papers, but, but there are several uh, tips that are important for writing in general. And as you know, we we do this uh, this meeting in English because I I stress that communication is extremely important, not only in your mother language, but an important part of the communication is also writing uh, communication. So it is for that I invite you Seppe, to, to give this talk. Okay, so enjoy it, Giuseppe. Feel free to, to start. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Hi guys. Uh, first, uh, I wish to thank Pablo for the kind invitation and the presentation, and you guys, the audience, for being here uh, today. As the title says, I will talk about some uh, tips that I consider important to improve the overall quality of uh, manuscript before starting uh, let me say that this is a kind of a personal journey okay and you will probably find different approaches in the literature but the observations that i will make here are backed by uh, as say, said pablo a decade or of interest into the the topic uh, they arose after reading books and some editorials and also from my previous experience while I was trying to publish my own my own papers, my own research. I start this presentation with a quote from the National Academic, Academic Press of the United States, where they say that the objective of research is to extend human knowledge beyond what is already known. An individual's knowledge enters the domain of science only after it is presented to others in such a fashion that they can independently judge its validity. So from this perspective, we can see that, that doing science and writing about science are correlated, interconnected tasks. That means even if we adopt the protocols of the scientific method, what we do in our labs uh, only becomes science, truly science, when we publish it. Because only then we give the opportunity to other people to check and validate or even refute, if it's the case, that information. Once we know that, the next step is to ask where these works, these uh, pieces of science are published. And the answer, I guess you know, is that uh, papers are published in specialized periodic publications that we call journals. Now we can make our work visible before acceptance as a preprint, which is it, put into an online repository. But this kind of discussion with the scientific community is still incipient. And many journals they do not accept works that have been previously published as preprints on these platforms. So submit manuscript to a journal based on their peer review system is still the best answer to the question, how do I publish my paper? In short, we must publish our text in the form of a paper in the scientific journal arbitrated by anonymous reviewers. We also have a, a tendency in big journals of publicize the names of the reviewers only for the accepted papers, but this is also a tendency, it's not well established by the whole community. We, we know that we have a lot of options to, to publish our research. I guess that are 
thousands of journals covering virtually all the, the fields of human knowledge. So it, it is important to have some parameters to choose those ones where the chances of publication are better and uh, the scope fits to our research. Of course, we will not try to publish a research, let's say, of electrochemistry into a journal of uh, history of the civil rights in the United States and America. It, it doesn't make sense. So the first parameter is the scope, of course. Uh, about this, this subject, there are nice tools online as the journal finder from the uh, Elsevier publisher, where you input a tentative title and an abstract, and the platform suggests a list of journals based on the works that best fit your research. But I strongly recommend you to read the guide for authors in the aim and scope section of the journal before submitting the manuscript. It will give you a, a very nice idea about the scope. But uh, let's assume once the scope of the research is defined, now we've gone from those thousands journals to maybe a few dozen, but we still have to, to make a choice. Now we have to speak about the relative quality of the journal. And uh, here we have good answer. Different journals uh, inside a, a field can be compared to each other thanks to a parameter known as impact factor. Pay attention to that. I said they can be compared inside a field, not among different fields mainly because the size of the communities is very diverse in different areas and such differences can add a numerical bias that will distort the, the analysis. With this caution in mind, let's define the impact factor. The impact factor is basically is, is a number. It is the ratio between the number of papers published in a given period, typically one year, and the number of citations uh, that these same works received in the two subsequent years after they have been published. Once we know what the impact factor means, it is easy to conclude that the parent quality of a journal is uh, correlated with this number. In other words, as higher is the impact factor, more people are reading the papers published there, more prestigious the journals tend to be, and ultimately higher, higher are the chances that future papers be read simply because they are published in the right place. Well, I think you already anticipate that publishing in a big journal is a very, very competitive process, simply because everyone wants to publish there. Moreover, in the last uh, years, low acceptance rates are becoming a kind of, uh, how do I say that, a secondary prestige site. Currently, it is common that even very specialized journals, as in our area, electrochemistry and electrocatalysis, present acceptance rates as low as 20 or even 15%. That means that publish a paper in a good journal is not exactly a walk in the park. And I like this picture here because it illustrates well how hard this process can be. We must remember that the first group of people who will read our manuscripts are probably specialists that are not particularly interested in to accept. We can say that this is the second grand barrier that we have to overcome. The first one, of course, is the, is the editor himself, but I will be back to this topic when we discuss the cover letter. For now, what I mean is that publishing well is for sure a required step for a successful career. But our papers must be read and the impact factor only tells us how was the past of, of that particular journal. It says nothing about the chances that one particular paper be read in the future. Once we keep those ideas, those assumptions in mind, we can move on and discuss some important aspects related to all elements that constitute the manuscript. Those elements are depicted here in this figure. I like to separate them into three groups. In the left, we have those elements that will appear in the paper itself. These are the classical uh, sections of each paper. But uh, see, we also have another group, additional elements, 
shown in the right column here, uh, which refer to the information presented in the online version of the paper. And finally, we have the cover letter, the document that presents our work to the editor before the, the peer review process can begin. As I said, we will come back to the cover letter later. It will be the last part of this uh, presentation. Phew, phew. Yeah? You come back uh, to, the, to the previous one. Yeah, here? It's, yeah. It is nice that the part in blue is more or less the same since many decades ago. Maybe it is the start of the scientific publishing. Yes. But the... The other parts the are new. In are, are changing a lot. Eh? Yeah, we were yeah. invited in the last paper, in the paper of Rafa, to, to publish a live slides. There is a video with a PowerPoint that you can supply and you can also make videos sometimes it's for free but many times you have to pay it is for that uh, that we are not used to do that yes, uh, but uh, that, that's a, that's a, a relevant added because this part is uh, always changing it's completely new and each time that you will submit a paper you have some news now have the author's statement which state what authors are doing in the paper what why they are they are there it's an interesting topic let me present you some things some important things at least from my point of view about the coverage of the of the scientific speech the expected coverage of a, a typical scientific speech presented in in a paper so in the in the introduction of the paper, we are normally present the context in which that research is inserted and the topic used to be of interest for a wide audience and deals with uh, big problems that affect many people as, I don't know, uh, seek for a cure of some disease or ways to uh, alleviate the global climate change and, and things like that, okay? After presenting this uh, outlook, we have to establish the, the premises of our work, which means that we have to show the argumentative elements which build the logic that supports our work. Let me give you an easy example, which is related to our research area. Uh, it's undeniable that we have uh, problems with increasing concentrations of atmospheric CO2 uh, generated by anthropogenic activities or human activity. That could be our first premise in this hypothetical introduction. Another one could be, we know, including based on the observations made in other planets as Venus, that CO2 provokes a severe greenhouse effect that increases dramatically the temperature of uh, the surface of a planet. Okay, now we have uh, two premises. Hence, we can argue that the average temperature of the Earth is increasing due to the increasing CO2 levels present in the atmosphere. So we must find a way to decrease those concentrations. And that's the gap in this example. That's where our research becomes important. For sake of, of simplicity, let's stay in this example. Uh, assume that as a chemist, like many of you, I am devoted to find, a, let's say, a way to capture CO2 from uh, the atmosphere and then convert it into a, a harmless substance. And now we know the objective of the work. With this, we close that section that we call the introduction. Once we define our goal, it is time to present the experimental section to our readers or potential readers. In it, we tell the story of uh, what protocols we adopt, uh, what parameters we control and follow to see if and when the objective is reached. Then we present our data discuss it based on our own results and also establish some kind of link with the previous papers in the area 
And finally conclude, if we reach the target defined at the end of the introduction, together with uh, eventual consequences of uh, our research. Before moving on, let's take one last look at the scope of this structure. See, uh, we begin with a wide topic, and as we are moving down towards the end, our arguments become uh, more and more specific. Finally, they turn to grow in kind of amplitude as we consider the implications of our findings envisaging future research. Uh, let me say a word about the context of the research. We, human beings, we are storytellers. See that uh, a proper context can, can create that bond with the reader that will keep its attention until the end of, of, of the paper. After all, if the, the paper is not read, it will be not cited, probably. Now, imagine that I start a presentation saying that the interest of my research group is to study how some molecules interact with specific surfaces and that we put the species together, the species of information, of course, by using spectroscopic techniques as in situ FTIR and that these techniques generate spectra like this here. And while I speak, someone may be asking, why does this guy do that? Now, let's try a different approach. Imagine that I tell you that plants are biological machines. Improved by ages of natural selection, and that these organisms become very efficient into combine simple molecules and uh, the energy captured from the sun to generate more complex molecules. And if we are able to reverse this cycle, we can obtain simpler molecules from complex ones. And why do we do that? They deliver electrons that can be used to generate electricity. The plants are the intermediaries of our use of energy captured from the sun. And that's why we are interested in to oxidize these relative big molecules. Now you know why I'm interested in such things. So the message here is that context matters let's become our message relevant to our reader. Now, let's take a, a, a brief uh, look into each section of uh, the manuscript, envisaging the best possible outcome. Uh, concerning the title, I, I will follow the, the structure of a typical paper, okay? Concerning the titles, I suggest some uh, attributes. A good title must be focused, be faithful to the content of the paper, Please, guys, please do not deceive the readers with uh, fake news of some exaggeration in the title. And I use terms and expressions that are traditional to the field. Believe me, a title is never a good place to use uh, uncommon words or create acronyms because people are not searched for them in there. Your paper runs the risk to, of becoming invisible. And also, whenever it's possible, it must be simple and short. Here I would like to show some examples of titles of several important uh, journals. You can see that there are no rules. A title can be uh, some kind of provocation. It can be uh, the best, based on the best, on the, the, the most important conclusion of your work. It can be a question. Basically, the rule is that there are no rules. Make sure the title of your work is simple, clear, short, and the rest is up to you and up to your creativity. Uh, now about the keywords. Today, the, the keywords, I, I would say that uh, they are re less relevant than before because the search can be made into the whole document. Anyway, I, I recommend that you we choose them uh, thinking in the visibility that we can give to our paper and also use classic terms. And I like the idea of uh, this increasing specificity just to be coherent with the structure of the paper itself. One last advice, uh, you, you can test the, the, the keywords 
before using them. Search them and uh, see what papers return. Are they linked to your research? If so, uh, it means that you are probably targeting the right public. If no, maybe you have to pick some, some different keywords. Regarding the, the abstract, uh, it is important to provide context, determine the relative relevance and establish what you are aiming for. Never include uh, technical details because many times uh, the potential reader is accessing your work through a platform like uh, Web of Science or Scopus and he or she doesn't have access to the full paper in this moment. Then this reader will have to decide if the paper matters to our own purposes just based on the title and the abstract. Also, because of this, the abstract must be self-contained. Uh, avoid uh, making references to any parts that are only accessible in the, in the full text. Avoid obscure abbreviations and uh, acronyms here because you don't want to spend precious uh, space and characters explaining them. Otherwise, you will break the rule that the abstract must be independent of the paper. Look at this. Uh, this is a, a paper published in The Lancet, and the summary says, HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, PREP, is effective but underused in part because clinicians do not have the tools to identify PREP candidates. It's fantastic. The authors are, are able to condensate the information in such a way that uh, the gap is already is joined with their own context of the research. And then they follow. We developed and validated an automa automated prediction algorithm that uses electronic health record data to identify individuals at increased risk for HIV acquisition. For me, it's fantastic. In a few words, the, the authors define what the article is about. It's simple, it's short and elegant all at once. Now, uh, they, they have yeah. the great advantage that almost every people in the world knows what yes, HIV is and the problem it causes. You know? the, the concept uh, yeah. of your research is uh, is unequivocally related with the uh, the abrangency of the of the topic itself uh, but uh, let me show you its other example and I'm, I'm not even talking about the title which is bad but let's read the voltammetric electroxidation rates or formic acid formaldehyde and methanol in acidic electrolyte on carbon supported platinum nanoparticle films with varying particles diameters in the range of about two to nine nanometers are examined. Oh my God, I'm already tired. I'm already bored. Please don't do that. This is a bad example of how an abstract can be built. The authors are trying here, and this is an important paper. And these guys are important authors in our area. But in this case, they fail miserably. They are trying to condensate the whole manuscript into the abstract. The abstract is not this. The abstract is a piece of information with the minimum requirements to the reader to decide if that paper matters or not for his or her purposes. Just that. Pablo, you, you, you told me that you have a... No, there, uh, what I see in the last years, of, of course, uh, you have to, to try to be simple and all those kind of things that you mentioned and I completely agree mm -hmm. but I see like two teams the teams I take part on that is the, the people that would like to include at least the most important conclusion in the, in the abstract um, there are some people that my opinion is an older idea that they do not like to include the, 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 the conclusion the after. Actually, it happened when, they, they want when to I collaborate hide information. with yeah, when I when I collaborate with people, I always give the advice of putting the conclusion, and some people simply do not choose to do that. They prefer to create like a like a suspense. But I think that that is an old idea. Today, with the, you have thousands 
of paper being published every day. So you need to catch the attention of the people. Uh, it is for that that you start from the title, and then if you convince the, the person with the title, the person is not going to decide to read the entire manuscript, the paper, sorry, but will go to the, to the after. So you have just another opportunity. If you don't convince the person in the after, your paper will not be read, probably. So I prefer to put the conclusion. Then the person thinks that the conclusion is interesting, yes, me, me too, will decide to read uh, the paper. Even because, yes, uh, even because uh, I, I don't think that uh, the decision of the reader will be based in the presence or absence of uh, of the conclusion. Uh, it doesn't make sense to create such a mystery. The people we read our paper because they are interested in how how do we get those conclusions? A good point, it's a good point. Uh, okay, after the abstract, we have now the introduction. Remember that the introduction is the place where we truly present the paper for the reader. Here is important to say that there is no such thing as a review of the literature in the introduction, unless the paper itself is a review. Make sure you present the context, what are the most recent contributions in the field, what is the gap based on, that, on those contributions, and what is the innovative aspect of your own work compared to those previous contributions. And just that, of course, you need to read a lot of papers to be able to write the first one. You need to know the area, know what the people were doing. But this is an information that you keep for you. This has not to be present in the introduction of one paper. That's the most important message. Follow this structure here because it is presented basically on the introductions of each good paper published in the each good journal around the world. About the experimental section, perhaps the most important thing is to guarantee that all relevant information are there. Otherwise, we take the risk of generating results that no one can reproduce as those examples illustrated here. And this can even affect the, the author's reputation. I know that people tend to be lazy when writing the experimental section because it is boring to write and also boring to read. But imagine that you are going to teach to someone how to make an apple pie and forget, or even worse, simply neglect the need for sugar. With the experimental section, it's the same. So let's try to tell the whole story. And another aspect that I, I could sit here is only present the necessary information. You don't have to put the equipment brand. This is not the necessary information. The sensitivity, yes. The brand, no. The quality of the science that you are doing has no nothing to be with brand. Okay. When present an information, allow the reader to understand it immediately because. We know that this section is already boring, so you have to close the reasoning in the same paragraph. Do not think like in experiment two if you don't tell the reader how many experiments are. And I, I would suggest that it's better to avoid numbers because numbers, they, do, uh, they are not related with any mnemonic rules. It is better to use things as if I using low concentrations, I will refer to the experiment LC. High concentrations, HC. It's simple and allows the reader to memorize this information at a first glance, okay? Present the operational variables and how they were measured. Uh, be precise in the use of terms uh, like concentration, the wave numbers, avoid things like level, Okay, or impression. If you use acronyms, choose the classic ones, or if you have to create someone, uh, uh, let's guarantee that they are easy to understand and memorize as in the example that I just told you. 
And if possible, separate the experimental section into topics, because you, you give the reader the, that uh, mental pause that many times necessary when you are reading uh, a text that is, is not the, the most uh, important one of the, of the paper. Well, sure, let me add something. Yeah. But you, you, you mentioned reputation of the scientists. Maybe it's not very clear for all of the student, but I have a, an example that is maybe about something that the researchers did not on purpose. Yeah? Because some, uh -huh. some researchers try to hide information for you not to be able to, to do the same, and they to try to be the, the unique group in the world that publish about that. It, it doesn't make stupid. sense. But stupid, there, yeah. there, there are several people that do that. But something that can be not on purpose is the following. For example, when you synthesize a well-shaped uh, or shape control platinum nanoparticles, in some protocols, if you prepare the solution of platinum the same day that you are going to produce a nanoparticle, you will not get the same nanoparticle that they say in the paper with the same yeah. shape. To do that, you need to prepare the solution and wait at least two days. Maybe the, the researcher have no informed it because they didn't notice, just because they prepared the solution and let the solution there, uh -huh. okay? or because they did, they do not they did not want to to inform. But the result is the same. You you will get their paper, you will read the paper, you will try to do the same, and you will not be able to repeat the results. So, what you are going to do? Next time that you find the paper of the same group, you will probably not try to replicate the result because you will not trust that group anymore. Let's move on to results and discussion section. And here my main advice for you guys is uh, guide the reader, but at the same time, never fall into the trap of over-describing the data. Remember that our reader is not stupid. So imagine how boring it could be that I'd say, okay, let's take this platinum routinium composition of 94 in the text, I said, 0505, and the current density for this specific material is around I don't know, 2.5 microamperes per square centimeter. Now, when I turn the composition a little richer in ruthenium, the current density becomes three and so on. This is annoying. The reader is, is able to see that within the picture, okay? So the text that will present the picture have to talk about tendencies. Look what we have written here. As platinum ruthenium surfaces become richer in ruthenium, the current densities increase and reach a maximum for this one, 7426, this one here, the green one. However, the, this maximum is exceeded when a minor amount of ruthenium is replaced by rhodium in the ternary composition. Whenever it's possible, we have to describe our results like this, showing tendencies, not showing numbers. Oh, we have another example. In this case here, uh, of an, an article of two years ago, we were interested into electroxidized uh, CO and to uh, platinum surface modified with growing coverage of tin. And the first thing, uh, this, this uh, series of, of pictures give me some trouble to discuss them because the the behavior is complex so the first thing that we do we did it was separate the the overall behavior in two different regions and now it's easier to describe what is happening with each individual region when the coverage of tin increases for pick one Basically, the oxidation charge becomes the same, but the oxidation, uh, the, the peak potential is displaced. The, the whole 
uh, oxidation wave is displaced toward lower potentials. For peak two, the behavior is different. Uh, we have the same oxidation charge, but now it's spread uh, along a wider uh, potential range when the content of tin increases. And for peak three, they simply diminishes when the, the content of tin increases. That's the point. And if you read the paper, it's exactly what we are telling there. Also, only include the results necessary to support the conclusions of your paper, as long as they illustrate representative behavior. Uh, it's not a matter of hiding data, but remember, you wrote a paper, not a report. In this example here, we have some micrographs showing beautiful nanocubes of uh, palladium, and there is no need that we show, I don't know, a dozen micrographs. We show one and see, okay, we can put this information in the supplementary material of the paper. But we show one and say, okay, this is representative of the, the, the whole sample. You don't have to show everything that you did. About tables, tables must be used to summarize uh, information. Uh, they are not the best option to show tendencies. In this case, we are comparing, I don't know, I guess Pablo is in, uh, the author of this work. Am I right? I, I, I don't remember. I don't remember. Maybe it was several, several years ago. Yeah, yeah, it's an old one. Yes, I guess. But it, here we are. I think that they, that you, uh, Kawe went to La Plata to, to do impedance with those materials. So we are interested in to see the volumes of micro and mesopores into different materials, but they are not related with each other. So it's better to use a table more than a figure. And please, if we have a small series of um, numerical data, sometimes it's better to present it in the form of a text simply because they will occupy less space, but never repeat data presented in a table as a text. You have to choose one, one of two ways. About pictures, a picture is a, a kind of visual information. And today it, it becomes a more and more a key point, I guess, to keep the attention of the reader. And we know, particularly for the younger among us, you guys uh, that are seeing this presentation, that people are increasingly less willing to spend time uh, reading long texts. And that is, is precisely where figures become uh, important. So uh, spend some time thinking about how to convey the information in the clearest and most elegant way possible. In this slide, I show two examples. They refer to the same data. And I realize how the reader's in immediate understanding can be evoked by the correct way of presenting those results. In the first case, we have a mess, while in the second one, the data seems to speak to us. So it spends some time to present the best figures you can you can do. And we can go beyond. Uh, big pictures can be a, a combination of uh, different techniques, techniques as we I show here. Uh, we can use different scales to show important details of less developed si si signals, as uh, in this case. We can combine experimental data and pictograms. In short, Again, there are no rules and creativity is the, the key as long as we don't forget that the reader is the focus of our work, okay? Uh, what more? Giuseppe. Yeah. Don't you think that in, in, in some years it will be, it could become more popular or more common maybe to start replacing figures by gift or videos. I'm saying that because I guess that yes, two I days ago, Eloisa sent me a gift about some measurement, and I love the gift. It was a gift with a voltamet several voltammetries at different times, several consecutive voltammetries. So it was like your 3D or the FTIR, the, that you show in the previous slide, uh -huh. if you can come back. 
the give was like come back the, the, yeah the give well imagine that this you have one. this, this here, yeah yeah but the give was like rotating yeah in, you in know 2D, yeah or, or even in 2d but uh the signals are yeah. are changing in a video okay so they yeah. they, 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 they give was really illustrative and with the power of the computer today is uh, how things have changed I think that, for example, in that FTIR, if they, if they are appearing at different times, it would become much more easier to see the trend that when yeah. all of them are together. I think that could it happen. It's probably, it's probably the, the, the future because uh, today there is no sense in to make, a, a, I don't know, print a paper. Everyone reads the papers online, so why not to use these tools? Mm. I agree with you 100 yeah. percent. Yeah, several people say that they prefer to read on paper, but I don't think that they will continue preferring that if you have an animation. I have also prepared videos that is not for a paper now, but we could be for a future paper. Uh, explain how to set an FTIR in situ. So mm. imagine that the experimental part, the, the parts where people show how to set a cell or that kind of things. A video is much more illustrative than text, you know. So I think that, that kind of that kind of section can change a lot. In the, yes. In the future. I hope so. Here I have uh, uh, other examples. In this case, we have uh, potential, which is common. The potential range is common for all these materials and also for all these uh, parameters that we are showing here. So why do not to construct a, a figure where these informations are joined together? We can use pictograms to illustrate some experimental protocols and even things like that that we have used in our one of our previous papers, Pablo, you should remember. Uh, we Here we are using scissors just to represent that these molecules are are being broken at some potential. I guess that we can move on. Okay, about the conclusions. The, the main idea, I'm trying to, to get the, the, the words. Uh, do not invent conclusions just to give the impression that your work is, I don't know, is sound. It's okay to reach a single conclusion, okay? This is not what will give the importance to your work. Uh, the second point, when we make science, we're dealing with uh, concepts, with ideas, rather than with data. Thus, although the, the conclusions are obtained from uh, many times very concrete parameters, in this section, it is preferable to highlight these concepts, the theoretical aspects, rather than to stick to the variables and numbers. Everyone thinks better and clear based on ideas than on numbers. Remember that. Uh, and lastly, uh, whenever possible, expand the, the discussion to demonstrate the, the relevance of the work in a more general context, like we did uh, in this last paragraph. Look, looking toward a broader perspective. When, when you give the, the, this kind of uh, hint to the reader, uh, it can generate the, the interest required to create the gap of uh, future work and your work uh, you are increasing the chances that your own work be cited for these these future authors about the acknowledgement two small things to about this section first uh, don't forget to mention the sponsors of your work it is common that uh, specific citation to those sponsors to be a, a contractual clause uh, for granting the research that you have used. And the second thing is, uh, it is in this section that you should thank the people who had a 
a smaller participation in the research, for example, by carrying out an isolated experiment, but who did not participate in the conception of or the discussion of the work. This is where they should appear and not as co-authors, okay? This is another important hint, I would say. About the references, there is little to say nowadays. I, I recommend you to use plugins or online platforms to meet the standards of that specific journal to which the manuscript will be submitted. Uh, it makes no sense to spend time including references manually. Basically, that's the, the most important thing here. Uh, about the graphical abstract, some uh, short advices too. Design figures for the audience, not for you. Uh, design a, a clear visual structure like this. Uh, use visual contrast like these. We have a lot of colors, but keep figures simple. Uh, create legible and uh, readable typography, like in this case, we can clearly see the typos. And above all, remember that the, the graphical abstract must be a pictorial figure capable of capturing the main uh, conclusion of the, or the, the main topic of the work, while allows the, 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 the reader to understand it at a first glance. If you fail in this regard, it is possible that your work will go unnoticed, which means that, again, you will not be cited. Now, let's talk about the cover letter. I consider it important to spend uh, some time here mainly because this document is not published together with the paper. So the uh, new researchers like you guys, uh, they, they do not have access to this, this document. So you don't have the chances to see examples of how it can be addressed. I strongly recommend this editorial published a lot of years ago in the ACS Nano by Jason Hafner, is the editor. And in it, uh, the, the, the editor remembered that editors are not necessarily specialists in your field of research. And sometimes they are reading about that topic of research for the first time. This is particularly true for uh, those big interdisciplinary journals uh, as ACS Nano itself. And in, in this editorial, Hefner advertised that the cover letter gives the chance for authors to persuade the editors about the relevance of their work in a, I guess, less formal way, we can say that, than, than what was written in the manuscript itself. Think, in, uh, this is an example that the, the editor uh, gave to us. Think in a cover letter like the kind of conversation that you would have with the editor of that journal over coffee. It's, it's, it's completely less formal than the, the work that you are presenting, for instance, in a symposium or in a congress. The language is, is more general because you have a, the, the editor has to attribute relevance and decide, okay, this is a piece of science good enough to go to the peer review process or this is a piece of trash let's remember that and finally uh, remember pablo already uh, talked about this there are today there are multiple resources that can be uploaded to help the reader to understand your research to reproduce it more easily or even to agree with your conclusions we can use videos animated illustrations map etc so use these tools to your advantage. I, I have uh, one example of supplementary material. Uh, basically, it must not be used as an extension of the paper. You, uh, the idea is that you are not, uh, you, it's not a good idea to evoke the supplementary material to refer to some of the arguments that you are using in the results and discussion section, okay? So the idea is just, show additional data that reinforces the argument or provide information that is not exactly required to understand the discussion. Like in this example, we have a map. And important, there is no space limit to this section, so you can read a lot 
and put everything that you consider important. Okay, guys, th that's it. If you are interested in these topics, I invite you to watch my, my videos on YouTube and subscribe to the channel. They are all in Portuguese, unlike this, this presentation here. And thank you again to the group for the invitation and for the interest. Thank you, Pablo.